Hi. <laughs> I come to you today with an interesting tale, to say the least. So welcome if you're new, which you most likely are. And if you're not, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, I will be sharing with you why I'm leaving the new age for Christianity, which if you've ever looked up this topic before, there are a lot of videos in this realm and I'm kind of throwing mine into the deep sea here. I was debating on whether I wanted to share this for the last few weeks, but it's just been such a powerful, fascinating, strange, but super exciting experience that I figured I, I need to share it. And I can tell you, I did not expect <laughs> to be ending this year as I am now and feeling how I'm feeling now and talking about what I'm going to be talking about now, it really kind of came out of nowhere. Although if I really think about it, there's been, there's been signs and there's been little breadcrumbs leading me here and I have dipped a toe in and kind of ran out and I have kind of taken a peek and then I got scared and I left and I've done that a few times over the last few years. I guess I just wasn't ready. And I couldn't have been ready any time sooner than now, I guess. So, you know, now is better than never. But I was raised in the secular world. Um, I don't come from any religion in particular. Um, my family is kind of a mixed faith background. And my mom, you know, my one of my grandmas wanted to baptize me Catholic when I was a baby. And, and she didn't want that because she wanted me to be able to choose, which I do appreciate because I have spent the better part of the last 10 years searching and exploring and just really diving into the, the majority of major religions that you can think of, excluding Islam. I never really looked into Islam, but I looked very heavily into Buddhism, into Hinduism, into Judaism. I have definitely dabbled in the new age over the last 10 years. I've done yoga for that entirety of that time. You know, I have crystals, still i never really i didn't really use them for like their healing powers necessarily I didn't necessarily believe in that but you know they're kind of a part of this world i have had tarot cards oracle cards divination tools i have dabbled in witchcraft i have dabbled in you know the occult i have kind of waded into those waters and i never really got fully submerged in the deep end, but I have experience with it and it was kind of my world view. And I will say that although over the course of these last few years that I've been kind of meddling in these practices and these ideas, I have of course had moments of bliss, of relief, of feeling close to God. I have had those moments and that's what made me want to continue doing them, of course. The reason why I, I did yoga every day was not just because it made my body feel good and it was a decent workout. It was because it really made me feel close to God. And that was kind of the best way that I could up until this point. And I will say I mentioned yoga so much because that is probably the one thing out of everything that I've been called to kind of, you know, do away with that was a struggle for me up until the last few days because it's just it's been so ingrained in my life but the topic of yoga and why christians are kind of not super into it is a topic for another day but knowing what i know now i will say that a lot of these new age practices which include yoga which include meditation which include using tarot cards or divination or astrology or witchcraft or any of these sort of things in this realm, they do open you up to the possibility of not so pleasant entities entering your realm. And I know that sounds pretty out there <laughs> if you're not in this world and I get it because I really didn't I couldn't hear that before I was like eh, okay like right all right bible thumper like you're so judgmental you know like why can't I just do what I feel like brings me closer to God I don't need to be in a church I don't need to read the bible I don't need to do this and that um I'm a very stubborn person sometimes and 
you know, I was, it's not that I wasn't open-minded because this whole time I was searching and seeking through all these different like ideas, right? So I am pretty open-minded and I think all of that um, exploration has made me well-rounded at the very least. Like I, I can speak on a quite a few different things with a lot of different people and, and I am happy about that. I'm pleased with that. But I will say that looking back on my life over the last few years, could I really deny the possibility that I had been meddling with dark spirits, given the fact that I had fallen into deep bouts of depression, serious mood swings where I thought I might be bipolar and I went to the doctor and got medicated for it. Which by the way, she was hesitant to give me that title because I guess she probably felt like, mm, I don't know if you're really bad, but you know, I'll help you. Um, I had periods of drug use, of relying on substances. I had periods of just, just not living in a way that was even in accordance with my deepest, my deepest moral compass, my, my true beliefs, like deep down in my heart. Like I wasn't living in accordance with that. I was living with, you know, a combination of these ideologies that our modern world feeds us, which is, you know, America, for example, is a very individualistic country. And, you know, the idea is, you know, you leave home at 18, you go and make it on your own, you make as much money as possible so that you could buy a house, so that you could do this, so that you can do that. And obviously, it's become more difficult than ever before for young people to accomplish these adulthood milestones, which has made a lot of people of my generation feel like garbage. <laughs> um, but I, I followed that trajectory, I bought into that, and you know, along the way, I was introduced to these new age practices, you know, I was introduced to astrology and, you know, these ways of categorizing myself, of other people, um, you know, the moon phases and, and all of these things which are constantly changing. So using astrology as an example, if you really follow it, you're like, oh, today's the moon in Cancer, so I'm like sad, and then it's the moon in Aries, so I'm like excited, and it's a full moon, so I'm going crazy, and it's a new moon, so I'm manifesting, and like, it's always just like, da -da 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 -da. every single day there's something else, and there's a new reason for your mood to be kind of altered, which now I'm kind of putting the pieces together of like, hmm, <laughs> based upon what I was just saying, it's kind of interesting, and I don't blame astrology, but I do think that there is a self-savior complex woven through a lot of new age ideologies or practices like the whole idea that you can manifest anything you want and everything is you know in your power the law of attraction will work with you as long as you stay in a good vibration and you know did you do your yoga today did you meditate today did you clear your mind did you check your tarot cards did you check your crystals have you you know done enough plant medicines have you done all these different things to feel spiritually aligned and i know not everybody in the new age is doing all these different things i was like kind of picking and choosing out of a lot of different baskets but they do kind of all lead into each other. They're all kind of in the same realm. There's a certain kind of language of, you know, divine and vibration and, you know, these, like the universe and your higher self and your shadow and, and all this stuff, which I really fully bought into. And I think if you look at some of my older videos, which there's not that many, so you probably can, um, I mention these things and I, I speak on these things. And I think I was on, I was on the path to where I am now and I wouldn't trade that for anything so I don't have any regrets but looking back I am starting to realize that you know over the course of these last few years I've had a lot of periods where I was really depressed where I was really unwell where I was really confused I was feeling so lost I was feeling so abandoned by just like life in general and these practices and these ideas would help me temporarily they would kind of put a band-aid on it or you know i would even feel like bliss uh, for periods of time but then it would always kind of leave me crashing crashing down and, and hungry for more like i never felt fully satisfied i never felt satiated by any of the beliefs that i was kind of holding on to it always felt like i needed to keep looking i needed to keep searching like obviously there's more there must be more and 
this whole time I've believed in God, um, but because I wasn't raised religious, you know, I didn't really have too much in, of an idea about about God in a religious context outside of, oh, well, I don't want to follow rules. Like, I don't want to be told what to do by a book that's like 2,000 years old. Like, why, blah, blah, blah. Like, why would I listen to that? Um, you know, and... I am an only child and that makes you kind of a naturally self-absorbed person just because I really grew up like by myself with my mom for the most part and so like I was very focused on myself because you know I, I felt like I needed to do that to be successful I needed to fully just kind of be obsessed with myself in order to make myself into something great to be successful to prove people wrong because you know my story is kind of unique like I, I didn't really have a a normal well what is a normal childhood but I had a pretty there was good moments of course but I had a pretty challenging upbringing um, both of my parents have struggled with substance abuse to various degrees my mom is doing well now and she's an incredible person and I admire her so much for raising me by my by herself I as I get older I continue to have no idea how she's able to do that um, but she had her demons and she struggled with alcohol a lot. Um, there would be periods of that being more intense than others. But when that was happening, I, I really didn't have any sense of, of certainty. Like I never knew what I was really coming home to and that was pretty challenging. And my dad, God rest his soul, um, was an amazing person, so funny, so smart, can make friends with absolutely anybody, the most charismatic person you've ever met. Um, nobody would have really guessed how much he was really suffering. Um, he was adopted and I think that made him feel kind of unwanted from the start. And he, he said he had this kind of, this void, this hole in his heart that just like couldn't be filled. So, he was a really, really good dad to the best of his abilities, but he really struggled with substance. He was a heavy alcoholic and he ended up dying of a heroin overdose when I was 16. And we didn't even know that he had gotten that bad up until it happened. It was very sudden. So, you know, I definitely had my challenges growing up. So by the time I was a teenager, I had a hard time going to school because just everything was kind of catching up to me. You know, as a kid, I didn't really have anyone to talk to about these things because who who else was there to witness it or experience it? It was really just me. And I kind of had to hold it together. So by the time I became a teenager, I, I started having a lot of anxiety. Um, I, I really didn't want to go to school, not because I didn't want to get my education. I, I loved the academic part of school. And it's not like I was really bullied or anything. It's just, I felt so self-conscious. I felt so anxious. I felt so uneasy. And ever since I was a baby, actually, I was an insomniac. I couldn't sleep. I, when I was a kid, I felt like I was tormented by the paranormal. I felt like I could see ghosts. I felt like I could hear things, I could see things. And you know, you hear a lot of stories about that, about kids saying, oh, mommy, look over there. You're like, what? Like, kids can see and sense things. They are closer to where we came from. So there's something to that. But I was I was tormented by this. Like, I really couldn't sleep and I was just very disturbed. <laughs> so by the time I was a teenager, you know, those habits started all catching up with me. And I it wasn't easy for me to, you know, be up and ready at 6 a.m. when, you know, maybe my mom was drinking all night and blasting music and I couldn't sleep and there was just a lot of stuff happening, you know? So I started partying and drinking and, and all of that really young, um, since I was about 13 years old. And that continued up until probably my early 20s. I, I pretty much had enough of the party lifestyle by the time I hit 21 exactly. I think the last time I've been to a club was literally on my 21st birthday. And then I was like, I'm kind of good on all this. Um, but I definitely developed the habit of utilizing substances not so much to, I don't know, like I would use them socially. Um, when it came to weed, I would use that pretty much daily as like a daily habitual thing. Like I wasn't even considering the fact that I was altering myself after a certain point, it just became normal. But as far as like drinking went socially, I felt the need to drink 
in social situations because I'm a very sensitive person and it's not necessarily like emotionally sensitive. I'm just like a very highly attuned person. So like if there's like a lot of noise and a lot of people and a lot of sound, I would feel really overstimulated and really overwhelmed. And I kind of felt like I needed to dull myself, like my, my feel, like my actual internal feeling of life. Like I felt like I needed to dull it in those environments to, to hang, to be able to cope basically. And that kind of became a habit. Luckily, interestingly enough, you know, with the parents that I had, I, I still, I was able to not get too deep into anything. I never had like a serious problem. I never, you know, had to go to rehab or overdosed on anything, uh, thank God. But I've definitely dabbled and I've, I've explored, you know, the darker realms of life, um, absolutely. Especially when I was living in the city, you know, it's it's very common to, it's common for girls, especially, you know, you're in your early 20s, you know, you don't have a lot of money, and the it feels like the culture is kind of telling you like, oh, well, you know, the world's gonna, the world's gonna sexualize you anyway, so you might as well like profit off of that, you might as well profit off the fact that people kind of see you as a product anyway, like, you know, um, and so when I was in my early 20s, I experimented with sugar dating and I was a sugar baby for a time. Although, you know, by the grace of God, I really utilized that as a genuine way of dating. Like it never became work for me. Like I was not a professional. Um, I was not an escort, but it's a very fine line, you know, even though I... I met someone through that realm that I ended up, you know, we mutually fell in love and we had this beautiful experience together and it was it was just like regular dating except I was also being financially supported, which at the time was amazing. It was amazing to me that, you know, I could have so much fun and make money almost effortlessly, like a lot of money, and it looked so glamorous. And the environments that I was in were the most envir uh, glamorous environments I had ever been in, like, you know, hanging out in a penthouse on the top floor in the moonlight overlooking the whole city, or in the Caribbean in a five star resort, or, you know, in the Hamptons, and these different environments that make you feel like, you know, you're you're towing the line of morality in a way but because your environment is so beautiful and because you're so at least i was like so swept up in the relationship itself like i i i i did eventually get to a point where it just didn't feel right anymore but it, it took a while because you know eventually it became a part of my survival like you know i was living in the most expensive city in the country one of the most expensive cities in the world um by myself as an entrepreneur uh trying to run a business and trying to pay a rent that was exorbitantly high for such a small little place things like that there was just like a lot of pressure on me to to really have my my stuff together at a relatively young age we're talking like 23 24 so i fell into a world that, you know, like I said, you, car drive by, like I said, you know, it's a really fine line. And I think people who hear my story when I, when I really tell the full story, which I'm hesitant to, you know, they don't really believe me that, you know, at this point in my life, living in the city, I was paid to just go on genuine dinner and drink dates with people. Like I would make a few hundred dollars to have drinks with the guy who worked in finance and was bored or have dinner with the guy. But I never, I never like took it to the point of, you know, selling my body for money. Like I never took it to that point simply because I knew that I wouldn't be able to live with myself because I'm so sensitive and that's such an intimate thing and I, I intuitively knew that that would like break me. So I, I always kind of towed the line and I was able to get away with it because I was very open with people about like, listen, this is who I am, like, I'm not gonna do that, I'm not gonna do this, but I will go out with you or I will meet you here. And even though you know, I didn't get too deep into it. I still, I still had an experience that was extraordinarily traumatizing. You know, you, 
if you mess around in the wolf's den and you're gonna get bit you know what i mean so it was it was very traumatic it was definitely life altering and you know i do believe it was meant to happen because it it, it did wake me up in a way even though it took me a while to realize what had even happened and what it meant and how it affected me going forward for like the years to come. So long story short, <laughs> I've definitely been through some stuff and this whole time, at least for the last five years or so, I've been becoming more and more aware of God's presence and I didn't really have a clear way to commune with that. Like I, I tried all these sort of different ways and I felt very spiritually connected, but like I said, it would always kind of be temporary and then I would fall off and then I'd be seeking something new and I'd be having these depressive episodes and it would knock me off my feet for a few weeks, a few months. Like it was very difficult for me to live a normal life um, with all of that stuff going on. So I ended up kind of leaving that sugar lifestyle behind about two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago, uh, thankfully, because it really just got to a point where I was like, okay, like, this is just not right. It doesn't matter that I'm drinking the finest champagne in a villa overlooking the ocean if I'm literally crying under my sunglasses and feeling so miserable. Like, what does it matter? What does it mean? You cannot buy fulfillment or peace or love I guess you could buy a companionship, but you can't buy a genuine feeling of peace. A lot of the people that I encountered in this realm, some genuinely great people with good hearts, but a lot of them were really struggling um, internally, even though they kind of had it all from the world's perspective, right? So that was really eye-opening for me. And, you know, I was drawn to that originally because I was just so curious and, and interested by a life of luxury and all of that like many girls probably are and i would caution you against that simply because all that glitter is certainly not gold um and i i definitely learned that the hard way but again i wouldn't change anything because it brought me to a point of insanity in a way that was the catalyst for where I am now even though it was kind of a ways away because it's been a like, it's been kind of a slow process up until about a month ago and then it just everything changed for me but I digress so I got out of that lifestyle I moved home for the first time in eight years you know I kind of healed my family wounds and and all that good stuff and then I ended up moving to where I am now um which is kind of an interesting situation in and of itself and there's been a lot of beautiful moments don't get me wrong and I'm living in a place that in an environment in a lifestyle that I actively manifested and it and at first it seemed like it was even better than I had imagined it was like oh my gosh you know like manifestation is so real I've manifested so many miracles which is true um which is true I've I've genuinely visualized things and had them come to fruition and be absolutely amazed and excited by the results however the dark side to manifestation and the law of attraction is us thinking that we truly know what is best for us and so we might be manifesting something that is actually kind of harmful for us but it, it feeds our ego or maybe it's actually leading us in the wrong direction but we think it feels good, it feels right, it's something that I want and I have it, so yay, it's amazing and it's the universe is so magical. But a lot of times when I manifested these magical, miraculous things, I would find that there was a dark side to what I had manifested that I, I truly didn't expect. I didn't see it coming and I am such a like a naturally optimistic person that a lot of times I don't necessarily consider what those negative aspects can be especially if you're thinking in the realm of law of attraction manifestation because like you don't want to attract the negative so like only think positive that's a big that's a big ideology of 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 abraham hicks for example if you're familiar with that is you know stay on the high flying disc stay on your high vibration and you know you'll manifest whatever you want is pretty much the idea which is true but like i said earlier a lot of this stuff is perpetuating the idea 
that we can be our own savior. And I know how attractive that sounds. And for some people, maybe it really does work and it worked for me for a time in, in, in a way, but it also really hurt me deeply because <laughs> I ended up in a lot of situations that I felt like, man, I didn't see this coming. I kind of feel trapped in this situation now because I put all my eggs in this basket and I put all my eggs in, in manifesting and, and, and this and that. And, I ended up in hot water a lot of times <laughs> because of things that originally seemed miraculous and amazing and exciting. And they ended up being a lot darker than I could have imagined. So, so lo and behold, I am living in a situation that I manifested and the last few months, you know, I had a lot of moments where I was really struggling. Um, I was feeling really deeply in despair. I felt kind of abandoned by God in a way and I felt confused and I felt alone and like I didn't know what direction I was heading in like I know what I want but you know I ended up in a situation that kind of stopped me in my tracks from from really getting it and it, it really just hurt me and confused me and I finally got to a point where I was like you know what I like please I just want clarity and I want to feel clear in my heart I was on a walk one day and the song Oh My Love by John Lennon came on and one of the lyrics is, you know, finally I can see, my heart is clear. And that really hit me. I was like, oh, I wanna feel like that. I want my heart to be clear. And so that day I was just like, you know, I wasn't quite speaking to God, but I kind of was, but I wasn't sure. I was like, please like just grant me clarity and clear heartedness and some guidance because I feel so lost. And literally like the next day or two, and this is, where, this, is, this is where it might sound a little crazy, but so I mentioned my dad and I mentioned that he's passed on. And, you know, honestly, I have felt closer to him in death than I got the chance to in life. There have been multiple times over the last, you know, 10 plus years that he's been gone where I have heard him pop into my head and, and start speaking to me. And I know that sounds crazy <laughs> if you've never experienced it, but if you were to hear your parents' voice, your best friend's voice, your partner's voice in a crowd, you could pick them out. You know that's their voice. You can't just like conjure up their voice. Like think about your best friend's voice right now. Can you just start like making it happen in your mind? <laughs> Cause I can, maybe some people can, but I cannot do that. I can, you know, conjure up thoughts, but I can't conjure up their voice, their cadence, their accent, their tone, like my dad had kind of like a New York, New Jersey accent. <laughs> and I hear him popping in, he used to call me Beanie. He popped in, he was like, Beanie! And I was like, oh, like, all of a sudden I heard him and he was like, look into Jesus, look into Jesus, look into Jesus. And I was like, okay, like, well, hello. And what's interesting is that since I moved here, this is his guitar and I placed it here at the edge of my couch bed. Um, just because, like, I moved in here and, I don't know, like, I thought it would be nice to have it there, no particular reason. Not too long after, I kind of felt him communicating with me. So, I know what you might be thinking, especially if you are a Christian. You're probably thinking, okay, communicating with the dead, like, uh oh not good. Um, but this is what I've been experiencing for the last few years up until this point. So, I don't know, take a look. Uh, so, yes. My dad from the other side started telling me to look into Jesus. And who am I to... To question him at this point like honestly i'm just like at my wit's end so so i did i i started googling i started researching i started watching videos i started watching movies um i ordered a bible like i immediately just kind of like dove in and obviously you know there is proof that jesus was a person he existed um there's historical proof of that everybody pretty much agrees with that there's no like there's nobody denying that he existed right and the Bible tells stories of these miracles that he has done. And, you know, as a person who was raised in a secular world, I, I kind of was like, okay, like I heard them saying, you know, Jesus died on the cross for your sins and, you know, he rose from the dead. And I was like, okay, like I really didn't even know what that meant. I was like, I'm not sure. I don't follow. So it didn't really hit me. It didn't really resonate with me. But when I started looking into it, I realized that there is real historical evidence that he rose from the dead. Now, again, 
if you come from a background that's not religious, that sounds like, okay, he clearly didn't, like, what are you saying? That's clearly made up. But what really got my wheels turning was, so Jesus had 12 apostles, right? And these were all people, normal, average people who had discovered him at some point in his ministry, which only lasted about three years, I believe. And they were so overtaken by what they saw him do, what they experienced of him, that they left their whole lives behind and they were like, I'm following this guy, that's it. And mind you, Jesus was a Jew, all of his apostles were Jewish, and the Jewish, you know, leaders at the time were not into Jesus, you know, they were not feeling him. They were like, okay, he's a sorcerer, this and that, but they still acknowledged that he existed and they still acknowledged that clearly he was working miracles because they even state in their text about why he's bad that he was doing some magical stuff so even they were like okay i'll give him that even though we don't like him so all of these people are following him miracles are happening amazing stuff is happening and you know the jews give him up to the romans and he is arrested so at this point all of his apostles are like um we're scared like clearly if they're coming after him they're going to come after us and they're afraid for their lives they're human beings and obviously it's scary to think of being tortured or killed so they got scared and they hid. Okay. Jesus was put on the cross. He was crucified. He dies. Three days later, the apostles start running out on the streets like, the Messiah is here. Jesus Christ is God. He rose. He's up. He's like, you guys don't understand. They came out of their hiding and they just were vehemently stating that he is the son of God, that he rose from the dead. And they saw them <laughs> with his, their own two eyes, especially Mary. Mary Magdalene, she said that, you know, he, she saw him fully walking around, standing, eating, drinking, like he rose from the dead. Now, that really sounds crazy, right? But at the same time, I was like, well, these 12 people who were afraid for their lives, rightfully so, three days later did a full 180 and decided, you know what? screw it like we need to tell everybody like th everybody needs to know this we don't care if we're literally tortured and killed for it which they were over the course of 40 years all of them were you know tortured and stoned and killed and executed because they refused to stop saying no like this guy is god like you don't understand he rose from the dead do you understand what that means and they were like you know brutally torturing them and none of them broke like it's only human if if they were lying <laughs> to eventually be like, okay, don't hurt me. Like, we're lying. Sorry. Like, please don't kill me. None of them did that for 40 years. And I saw a video that another YouTube creator made. Her name is Alana. Um, I'm going to link the video actually in the description because I think she describes this whole realm a lot more eloquently than I did. I do. Um, but there was a guy, I think his name was Chuck something who went to jail for being involved in the Watergate scandal, which is one of the biggest political scandals of our modern time. He went to jail and he said that he found Christianity in jail because he started looking into this and he said, you know, me and my 12 colleagues, it took us three weeks to break. We were lying and it took us three weeks to kind of give up. It took us three weeks. These people in much more extreme, brutal circumstances. They're, they literally gave their lives because they they were not budging. They're like, no, this is what it is. He rose, like, that's it. Like, you can kill me if you want, but that's it. All of these people, none of them broke. None of them tried to even save themselves. They were so, they spent every day of their lives after that point of seeing him rise to spread the gospel. And if they got killed, which they did, so be it. Like. That, that was really compelling to me. That was really like, okay, um, wait a minute. Because if he rose, if the resurrection is true, which is the basis of Christianity, the basis of Christianity lies in the resurrection. Because if not for that, then, you know, Jesus was a great guy and super inspiring and has an amazing character. But him rising from the dead <laughs> obviously takes things to another level. And so at that point, I think it was something like, 5,000 Jews, most of which were previously against him and cheering for his death at the crucifixion, they converted to Christianity. Their leaders were really not feeling this guy, you know, it's really not, not really what was going on. They were so moved by what they had experienced with him and I guess what they saw or, you know, the apostles just like fervency about this, 
that they converted and they were like the first Christians. So that's pretty crazy. Um, but anyway, yeah, and I'm going to link another video <laughs> about like the evidence of Christ if you're curious about that, because I can't really speak on that too much just yet, but I found that very compelling. But at the same time, you know, as I was looking into this, it wasn't just like an intellectual thing. Like I started noticing that the more I read about Jesus, the more I learned about his character and I started reading the Bible and I started reading these gospels and these, these portions of scriptures, because I haven't read even close to the whole Bible yet. I felt my heart beginning to soften. I felt a lot of just like the, trauma or the tension or whatever it was that I had been carrying around just start to like melt off of me. I, I don't even know how to describe it and I still don't really understand how that has happened. But it's like, <laughs> as soon as I started to be like, you know what, I believe. Like I, I did my research and not only did I do my research, but I started to feel in my heart like, this is true. Like this is really what it is. And I know that like, I'm cautious to say that just because I am the type of person that I don't want to tell other people that their beliefs or their religion is not true because I don't know what to do with that yet. But for me personally, someone who's been seeking for over 10 years and I've researched and I've tried <laughs> so many different things, most of the spiritual ideologies and religions that you can think of, I've probably meddled in it. But I never felt like this is the capital T truth. Like I was like, okay, this is interesting and all religions have some truth to them and this and that and the other. But when I started getting into this and I guess I was just ready to hear it because there is an aspect of, you know, I heard, I heard the stories of his miracles and I heard that he died for our sins and you know what that means, but I didn't really get it and I didn't hear it. Like when I heard Christians saying these things, they're, they were speaking Christianese. I'm like, what are, what are they saying? Like, okay, like, you know, a little out there, good for you. I didn't get it. I really didn't get it. <laughs> And then suddenly I started to get it. Like it started to like seep into my heart and I started to feel it. And I started to feel like my angst just like leaving me. And it was a really quick process. Like it was a matter of like a few days, if not like a week or so that it became noticeable. Like even my roommate has said like, wow, like you honestly are pretty different. Like I haven't seen you have any like outbursts lately, which I really struggled with anger. Like I've really struggled with like rage and, and kind of just not being able to control it very well. And I would kind of use the excuse of like, oh, I'm a Sagittarius. I'm like so fiery, whatever. Um, <laughs> but the truth is that it was just really hard for me to manage that. And I, I do kind of believe that it's something I, I got from my mom and you know, like I said, she had her demons and, and now I kind of starting to learn more and I'm like, did she actually have demons? But that's a story for another time. I don't want to, I don't want to get into that because I don't want anybody to feel like I'm fear mongering. Like I'm encouraging you to be afraid, to fear God. And that's why you should believe. Like, I, I'm not sure about that concept because if somebody had approached me with that, in that way, which I'm sure they had at some point, I just completely rejected it. I was like, no, I'm not feeling that. I wanna do my own thing, I wanna live my own life. I don't need a 2000 year old book to tell me what to do. Like, that's kind of how I felt about it. But once you have an experience with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, once you feel touched by that, it's not something that can be logically explained, but I genuinely just started changing. And for the better, like I felt myself First of all, feeling incredibly compelled to repent. Like I needed to repent for my sins. And I know how that sounds. Again, I'm mostly speaking to like secular people in this video because that, that's who I was like not that long ago. So I know how it sounds, but finally, yeah, I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I believe, I surrender, I repent, like I'm sorry. Um, I felt bad. I felt bad about all the years that I have spent kind of turning my back on what I feel like someone who's always been there for me and it might be the same for you and I wonder now if some people are, are called to this, if some people are like chosen for this path and, and not to say that in like in the religious way, like some people are chosen, like I mean it more like not everybody is going to resonate with this, right? Like uh, most people are probably not going to and I know that. I'm probably gonna lose some subscribers or something, which is fine. Um, I wish you all the best, but 
yeah, like, I don't know if everybody is necessarily called to, like, walk this path um, because it is called the narrow road for a reason. Like, if you're really living by the Bible and you're following these ideas, which for me, I'm following them now because it feels good for me. It feels right for me. It feels like, like a relief to have guidance, to have a higher power that I kind of feel sure of. Like obviously a big aspect of faith is that we can't 100% prove God. But there are a lot of atheists out there who are scholars of the Bible and the New Testament and all of this and they can't, they cannot deny <laughs> a lot of these things that are a core part of Christianity or they try to, but it's not so easy to do. It's not so easy to disprove, especially if something else I really have enjoyed watching <laughs> during this whole awakening period. You know, I've watched a lot of testimonies. I've heard a lot of stories that are like mine and there's always kind of like very similar threads through them, which is very interesting. But I've also been watching a lot of near-death experience stories and there's millions of them genuinely, but there's also hundreds that, you know, scholars have genuinely taken the time to study and they can't dispute them um, because, well, first of all, how would you even dispute it? But they've tried and they can't. And all of these stories, a lot of times they're saying, you know, what they saw and what they heard and who they saw. And a lot of times it's Jesus. It's God and they saw heaven, they experienced heaven. And again, as someone who's always kind of believed in more like reincarnation, not necessarily heaven and hell, um, I found that interesting and I'm still kind of reconciling that. But, you know, the idea is essentially that if you put your faith in Jesus, you are saved by grace, which again is like Christianese, like. You can only hear it when you're ready to hear it because again i was like okay but to i genuinely feel and this happened like right around my birthday last month in november it's the end of december now this happened at the end of november i really felt like i've been saved <laughs> and it felt and it still feels kind of like bewildering a little bit like i really didn't see this coming you couldn't have told me, oh, Julie, you know, by the end of 2023, you're going to be posting your video about how you came to Jesus. Like, I did not see this coming. <laughs> I did not see this coming, not one bit. But it's just, I've never felt more at peace. And as soon as I started really kind of putting my faith in that and, and listening more and listening more, I, you know, I follow what I feel like God is telling me and it keeps yielding really positive results. I feel safe. I genuinely feel protected. I feel like take the time to get closer to God and everything is going to work out exactly as it's supposed to. And at this point, I'm being weary about manifesting. I'm weary about the law of attraction now because like I said, it led me to places where I thought it was going to be the best thing for me and it turned out to be its own kind of hell on earth. So I trust what God has in store for me. But yeah, I don't know. I... I wasn't gonna upload this or, or tell this story quite yet because I felt like, oh, you know, the success story isn't finished. It's not like grand enough. Like some people have a story where they're like, I got hit by a car and I died and I saw Jesus. It's like, whoa. Um, I didn't, I don't quite have a story like that. It's kind of been a gradual and then all at once kind of thing. And I just feel, I haven't felt depressed. I don't feel anxious. I don't feel like I need to reach for these substances anymore for relief. I haven't drank in a long time. Um, I just like haven't. Um, I stopped smoking weed, <laughs> which has been like a really challenging thing for me to do, but I've done it. I'm waking up early and I'm kind of just like, I'm feeling healthy and inspired. Like I have a will to live. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I just kind of wanted to share this now to go back to what I was saying, because I've seen a lot of these testimonies and they're really inspiring. And from a woman's perspective, it's beautiful when I see them coming from girls who, you know, have been in similar troubling situations and lifestyles, kind of like how I have. And now, you know, they're married and they found their man of God and they have their babies and they have a beautiful home. And it's like, oh, it's so exciting and so beautiful. And I love seeing that. But I'm not there yet. Like I'm still, you know, I'm in my single season and I'm working on myself and I'm working, I'm working my way towards being truly ready for that. And I thought I was fully ready, but clearly <laughs> not quite almost. So I wanted to share my story for anyone else out there who's also kind of in the interim 
I don't know. I, I just, I've been having a lot of really shocking realizations lately and everything is kind of starting to make sense for me and I feel, I feel really good and I feel really good sober. I feel really good not being in a relationship. I feel really good not knowing what's in store for me. I feel really good not really having a lot of money right now, honestly, which a lot of people won't say on the internet because everyone wants to act like everything's so perfect and this and that. Like, no, I can't spend frivolously right now. I can't, you know, get my hits of dopamine shopping and whatever. And I feel perfectly fine with that. Like, I feel okay. I have everything that I need, thank God. And it's just like really humbled me genuinely like i look back on all the years i spent being so much so much in my ego for a lack of a better term and, and just being kind of concerned with all the wrong things in a way like luxury and status and all this stuff that it's you're really not going to take it with you when you go and you know the belief is is that you know if you put your faith in jesus you've got a spot for you in heaven and when you get to heaven it's bliss, it's perfect. You don't need anything else. And in some ways it kind of feels like I'm experiencing a little piece of that right now, just getting closer to God. So I'm sharing this with you because I don't know, maybe it will inspire you. Maybe it will make you think, maybe it'll plant a seed, maybe it won't. I realized recently something else that I didn't understand as someone uh, from the secular world is you know, why are Christians always like shoving it down everyone's throat? Like, okay, the gospel, this and that, like, it's amazing, awesome, but like, I don't resonate, so bye. Like, that's how I used to feel. And I've learned that the reason why Christians are so adamant about sharing the gospel with you and calling it the good news is because it really is good news to know that, first of all, and this is my belief at this point, that there is a God that is there with you, that loves you, that cares about you, that made you, and so knows you deeply. And he knows everything that you've done. And he still accepts you. He loves you as you are. And of course, he'd prefer if, you know, you live in accordance to his way. And I used to feel like, well, why would I want to do that? Like, I had problems with authority. <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to do that. But it's because it's what's best for us. I genuinely believe that at this point. I've, I've really tried everything else and I, I ended up at a loss. Like, what is the point? Why should I even keep living? Like, I truly felt pretty hopeless and I definitely dealt with, you know, suicidal ideation um, at many points during the last few years. It was a really, really, it's been a really challenging road for me. Um, I've genuinely really been through it. <laughs> And so to now kind of have this like peace and the sense of knowing, and of course, you know, an atheist or somebody like that would say, well, how do you know? You really don't have any proof. The peace that I feel is miraculous and it's strange and it's really proof enough because I really embraced and some people probably encountered me as like the tortured artist type and I really resonated with that because I really felt tormented and I am wondering, you know, because if you get a little deeper into this and I don't know how much I want to get into this here, but I do think that I may have opened myself up to entities that really tormented me, like genuinely made me feel like I should kill myself, like I should you know, do what is not best for me. Like, oh, you know, screw it. Might as well live a hedonistic lifestyle because, you know, it all sucks anyway. Like deep down in my core, sometimes I, I did feel like that and it didn't feel like me. Like it didn't feel right. And it felt intrusive. Something else that I think is kind of interesting to share is I think a lot of people can relate to having these kind of intrusive thoughts, these kind of like rude thoughts, or, you know, I should jump off this bridge, or I should push this person into the car, like, or just these like kind of mean, weird thoughts that like just come through you. And you're like, oh, what was that? Like, ew, is that me? What? Like, oh, no. That's how I would feel when I would get intrusive thoughts. And I realized, and this is like really interesting and kind of weird, since coming to know Jesus, I don't have those thoughts anymore. And I have asked, 
for these demons to be cast out of me because I do struggle with certain aspects of sin that I couldn't get out of on my own. First of all, I didn't even recognize that they were sin, but I felt like something was off and it wasn't good. It was like harming me, even if it felt good in the moment. Like I knew that it wasn't right. And I've asked, you know, like, deliver me from this. Like, please, I, I don't want to have these intrusive thoughts. I don't want to have these um, addictions or habits or, you know, I don't want to live this way anymore. And I haven't had those intrusive thoughts. I haven't felt compelled to drink, to smoke. You know, I celibate now, <laughs> full disclosure, like I was dating somebody. And as soon as, um, as soon as this happened, I was like, no, not till marriage. Like, it just, you're just like convicted. I don't know how to even explain it. And it sounds kind of crazy unless you've experienced it yourself. But it's interesting, like someone, being someone who wasn't raised religious, I guess, I guess it's kind of positive in the sense that I don't have any, I don't have any church hurt, you know, I don't have any like blockages around getting to know Jesus and God because of the church. Like if anything, I'm seeking out a church and I'm, I'm researching um, these different denominations and you know, these different ways of, of seeing theology and it's like super, super interesting and I'm still exploring on that front. But yeah, I don't have like any true barriers aside from the resistance that I just had myself. And it makes you wonder, it makes you wonder, like you might be having a really adverse reaction to this, which if you are, I doubt that you're still listening, but if for some reason you hung in there, I don't know like it's interesting because before this happened before it really hit me and before I really just like okay I'm devoting myself to this like that's it I'm, I'm ready let's do it before I really got to that point there was like little breadcrumbs being served to me like I would I would be recommended YouTube videos of like my testimony or like the one that really stuck with me which I watched like I, at least like a month before this happened maybe I'm not really sure but Kat Von D went on a podcast talking about why she's become a Christian. And if you know who Kat Von D is, she's, you know, tatted up from LA Inc. And, you know, she has a really dark aesthetic. And it was just like interesting to hear her talking about it. It seems like it's kind of at odds, just aesthetically speaking. And I remember her saying, you know, right now I'm really on fire for Jesus. And I was like, what? <laughs> like that really struck me as like, okay, like interesting. Um, I wasn't like judging it, but I didn't really get it. And now I'm like, oh, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty on fire for Jesus. Like I can't stop researching, learning, reading the Bible. Like I wanna spend most of my time reading the Bible and that sounds like crazy. Like if you knew me when I was a teenager and partying all the time and always out and about and always in the mix of everything, if you were, you know, to know me then and then to see me now being like, yeah, all I really want to do is, you know, read the Bible and wake up early and go on a little quiet walk. And, you know, it's so, it's so simple in a way. It's so like stripped down and it just feels so good. Like even, even vanity wise, like I've, I'm going on a full ramble tangent now, but in this day and age, a lot of women are praying at the altar of vanity, of beauty, because it is true that, you know, your appearance as a woman is kind of like currency. It gets you in certain doors, it opens up certain opportunities, and it's a really tricky thing because a lot of women who need to use their appearance as a currency are doing it to survive. It's because they don't have any other choice. Marilyn Monroe is one of my favorite examples of this, but she sexualized herself and she learned how to get men's attention very early not only because she was abused and that's kind of what she was used to but also because she had to she didn't really have a family she didn't have any support like that was the way that you could survive at that point so she fully embraced it and she spent hours you know looking at her face and perfecting her makeup and her poses and and all of this stuff and i i've studied her a lot because i've always felt very like I feel a kinship to her story in a lot of ways. And uh, I think a lot of women do because obviously she's stood the test of time this long. She's still an icon, she always will be. But an icon of what exactly? She was a sex symbol. And in reality, she was incredibly well-read, incredibly intelligent. She wrote poetry. She was just, she was very, 
misunderstood and that really pained her. So basically what I'm trying to say is in this day and age now where we have Instagram and social media and all of this stuff there, and I've talked about this in another video, but which, which has horrible audio quality. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I still like it. So I'm keeping it up. But in this day and age, it feels like you need to maximize your appearance to be worthy in this world. It feels almost like, I don't know, at least for me, that's really how it felt. And especially, you know, a few years ago, um, living the lifestyle I was living, like my appearance was pretty important and, you know, keeping my body really in shape and, you know, really taking very, very good care of myself externally. It felt like in a way, subconsciously, I was kind of purifying myself by doing these external, these external things. Like, you know, I still feel like actually working out in a, in a certain way brings me closer to God. I can hear him more when I'm practicing ballet, but in a different way, like it's, it doesn't work that way. You can't put things on the outside to heal your inside. And no matter how much attention or love or temporary love, you get from your efforts or money or whatever it is fame it's it's not gonna do it and that's why we see so many of these celebrities and so many of these people who it seems like they have it all they're absolutely miserable and a lot of them unfortunately you know fall into drugs or end their lives or these these really sad uh things so i i just started to realize since i've been you know come and i keep looking up because i have a cross hanging up on my wall but since i've been coming into this i i I've been more comfortable, you know, wearing less makeup and dressing a little more modestly. And I was already kind of like on that path. And I'll always like, you know, getting myself ready for the day and kind of feeling like I look in the mirror and I feel like I look cute. You know, I like having a little well put together outfit and I like, you know, my tried and true makeup and hair techniques and all that. Like beauty is a hobby for a lot of girls. It's, it's literally a hobby. And I don't think I'm going to fully get rid of that. But at the same time, I don't feel like my worth is dependent on how cute I look that day. Do I look pretty enough? Am I skinny enough? Am I this and that enough? If I'm not, then I'm like worthless. Like it's not a conscious thought that you're having, but it's something that I'm sure a lot of girls can relate to. And especially as you start getting a little bit older and your body starts changing a little bit, like you you can easily start to feel like, oh, oh, I need to do everything I can to, to stay looking like I'm 17 forever for the rest of my life. And it's like, that's not all there is. To purify and cleanse your inside, as cheesy as it sounds, is really gonna like radiate outward. It's gonna change your whole experience. People are gonna experience you in a different way and you're gonna experience you in a different way. There's no cream or technique or clothing or makeup or anything that could have that effect. So I don't know, it's kind of helped free me from those shackles a little bit too, which is just like amazing. So I don't know, there's just been, there's just been so many factors in, in just these last few weeks that I feel genuinely changed. I feel genuinely, I don't wanna say healed because that sounds very like definite, um, but I feel, I feel saved. Like I genuinely feel like I've been saved. And if you were to experience that too, you would wanna live in accordance to the God that has saved you, right? Like, I don't know, that's just kind of like the natural thing that happens because why not? It is, a little more difficult i guess like there's things to be aware of and to kind of stay away from but at the end of the day most of those things that you're trying to stay away from it's better for you anyway to stay away from them like regardless of what the reason is that you're doing it so i don't know i have faith and i just wanted to share that with you today and i hope you got something interesting out of it and you know who knows? Who knows if maybe this can plant a seed because at the end of the day, all I want is for you to feel at peace as well. All I want is for you to feel fulfilled and like you matter and like <laughs> you're, you're worth it. You're never too far gone. Nobody is ever too far gone for redemption. And that's a huge message of Christianity, true Christianity, that really moves me because you know, it's really easy to feel like, oh, you know, I've already messed up in life. Like, might as well just like throw in the towel. No, 
there's <laughs> there's so much ahead of you and at the same time we never know if tomorrow is going to be our last day so it is kind of urgent if you feel called to this path like it, it is kind of urgent <laughs> to follow it because we really never know like when our time on this earth is, is gonna be over. So <laughs> a little heavy, but that's okay. So yeah, I think, I think that's it for me today. If you've hung in this far, wow, I respect you. I commend you and I appreciate you. Thank you for watching. And if you're watching this in real time, I hope you have an amazing new year. And I will catch you next time. Bye.